So welcome to this year's Global Justice and Equity Conference, organized by our inaugural cohort of Global Justice and Equity Fellows. Our conversations today will focus on understanding and advancing the practice of community-engaged research. Our sessions include an exploration of multidisciplinary understandings of equity and justice, best practices for community-engaged research, and a case study of university community partnerships to address food insecurity in Durham. We hope that by the end of today, each of you will leave with enhanced understanding about the opportunities, the challenges, the different methodologies uh, for practicing community-engaged research. So my name is Carolyn Schul. I'm the faculty director of the Global Justice and Equity Fellowship. And I want to spend a little time telling you um, about this fellowship and about the fellows who organize this conference today. So the Global Justice and Equity Fellowship offers advanced uh, Duke PhD students full 12 month financial support, a cohort experience and professional development opportunities. We work with PhD students whose dissertations are situated in international or regional global studies and make an important contribution to understanding racial, social, and equitable justice. We have fellows from a variety of disciplinary backgrounds. And the inspiration for this fellowship lies in the work of the distinguished historian, Professor John Hope Franklin, particularly his pursuit of justice through scholarship and public engagement. This year's cohort of fellows includes Robin Fail from Duke's Marine Science and Conservation Program, Adrian Jones from Sociology in the Sanford School of Public Policy, Miguel Martinez from Political Science, Reshma Nargan from the Nicholas School of the Environment, and Elizabeth Brown and Saheem Park from Art, Art History and Visual Studies. They deserve a huge round of applause for the hard work they put into imagining and organizing this conference. And you'll be able to meet each of them as they lead their respective panels today. I also want to uh, thank Eve Duffy, who can't be present, unfortunately, because she's unwell. She's also the visionary director of this program. Julie Maxwell, who's our program manager. None of this would be possible without her, and also Aaron Dillard. Julie is producing a podcast featuring our fellows and their work, so please stay tuned for that. And part of the reason I'm spending so much time talking about this fellowship is that the next round of applications is due November 13th. So please spread the word among any PhD students who might be eligible for this opportunity. The conference is also supported by the Wilhelmina Rubin Cook Culturally Responsive Pedagogy and Practices Project. Wilhelmina Rubin Cook was one of the first African American students admitted to Duke University in 1963. She went on to have a distinguished legal career as a lawyer and a law professor. In her personal and her professional life, Ms. Reuben Cook exemplified resilience, leadership, and the empowerment of historically excluded communities. The goal of the Wilhelmina Reuben Cook Initiative is to generate collaboration between students and faculty that honors her legacy, and we hope that our conversations today are able to do just that. So why community-engaged research? as the focus of our conference today. <clears throat> Community-engaged research is really a theme that speaks across disciplines. It's an approach to knowledge generation that seeks to bring more just and equitable practices into traditional research methodologies. It strives to redress power hierarchies that favor the researcher's needs over community needs. It also recognizes that research is enriched by the local knowledge that comes with sustained and substantive engagement with local communities. Community-engaged research emphasizes relationship building and trust, open communication, co-learning, reciprocal transfer of expertise, shared power, resources, and decision-making, and mutual ownership of the processes and products of research. And yet, while the benefits of community-engaged research are well known, it remains largely at the periphery of dominant research practices. Even the most well-intentioned university and community partners face very real structural challenges to meaningfully involve community members, 
or organizations in the design, implementation, and evaluation of research. So today we'll have the chance to learn from researchers and community partners who are really at the forefront of this effort to advance community-engaged research practices, and I'm very excited to learn from them. Before we get to our opening panel, a few practical points. As you may have seen, there's coffee and breakfast outside. We'll have this through the morning, so please help yourself. At noon, lunch will be served um, downstairs, buffet style. All are welcome. Restrooms are just outside to the right, and there are parking passes available for those who parked in the visitor lot. Um, if you need one, you can check with me, or if you see Julie or Aaron who are wearing green sweaters, you can also ask them for one as well. So let's get started. I'd like to welcome Dr. Kay Jowers and Professor Edward Ballison. Um, Kay Jowers is Director for Just Environments at Duke University's Nicholas Institute for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability and the Keenan Institute for Ethics. She also co-directs the Environmental Justice Lab, which is a collaboration with the Duke Economics Department. Her work focuses on analyzing state regulatory and policy approaches to addressing environmental issues, and she, she engages questions of environmental equity, ethics, and justice head on. She has rich experience creating, leading, participating in collaborative, collaborative research teams that are focused on environmental justice, and we're really delighted to have her with us this morning. Edward Ballison is professor of history and public policy. His research explores the historical intersections among law, business, politics, and policy in the modern US. He has an impressive track record of scholarship, but the reason we invited him here this morning is for his unique insight into the institutional side of things. Since 2015, Professor Ballison has served as Duke's Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies working with university-wide institutes and initiatives to foster curricular innovation and collaborative interdisciplinary research, including often community-engaged research. So Professor Ballison, thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. To begin, maybe uh, we can start with Kay. I wanted to just hear your thoughts on what are we discussing today? What is community-engaged research? Sure. Thank you for having me. Um, community engaged research is, you know, almost self explanatory. It is groups of people who are working collaboratively in the case of research to do research together. Um, university researchers collaborating with groups who may be affiliated by geographic proximity, by some sort of special interest, by neighborhood or an issue area. And it's a really ambiguous term when we think about the methodology. So if you are a community engaged researcher, the second question when you meet another community engaged researcher is what kind of community engaged researcher are you? Um, and so increasingly we need to specify what we really do when we engage in community. Are we um, doing community-based participatory research? Are we doing participatory action research? Human-centered design? Um, so you can get into much detail. I tend to keep it at a using one of the spectrums of stakeholder participation, like Arnstein's Ladder or um, some of the others that are available. The CDC has one where you can really look at the range of where your research might fall on are you informing and educating? And some of them even at the, the far end might have community manipulation in them and it goes all the way up to community-led or citizen-led processes. So um, where I tend to put my emphasis in my work is on trying to be at that upper end, that upper third of any of those spectrums where it is at least co-creating with community, where they are helping to shape or shaping the problem set and the question that we're asking. And we really hope to move our partners along the spectrum in capacity. We invest deeply in our collaboration so that we can continue to work with them and move to a point where they are the ones who are leading our research partnerships. Um, and sometimes, you know, though that might not work for the particular type of question, if it is a, a question of policy, sometimes community groups will come to us and say, we would love if you as the Duke Environmental Justice Lab would just do this research and we could just step back. We just want to see what comes out of your research and the analysis that comes out, maybe because they don't want to be affiliated with it, they'd like to use it in a policy process. So we do sometimes have those kinds of projects if you look at, at what we're doing, but our preference and our ideal would be on that top third. So. Um, 
Um, I would just note that some of the, the complexities and tensions that, that Kay was referring to. So, so one challenge is uh, how do you define the relevant community? What happens when there might be differences of opinion within a particular geographic area or there are different groups? Or uh, how does one ensure representativeness? Um, they're, they're, uh, the, the degree of difficulty associated with this effort is not small. Um, you referenced in your introductory comments, uh, Carolyn, the importance of trust building. And so um, the, the value of this research is enormous, but the degree of difficulty is also actually quite high. And uh, to do, especially on that upper third, the, the kind of work that Kay was uh, describing, there's a lot of investment of time in, in building relationships that's necessary so that when issues come up, tensions come up, there's, the, the, there's a, a, a baseline of social interaction to sustain difference and conflict that is almost inevitable in these, in these situations, I think. I say this not as a participant in this type of research, but as someone who's increasingly trying to read about it and is uh, trying to help facilitate the opportunity for more of this work at Duke. Um, and so I'm, I'm underscoring this because it's, it's, it's crucially important. It's also really hard. You mentioned time as one of these conditions that need to be in place for effective partnerships and for trust to be built. Um, what are some of the other conditions that you think need to be in place to support effective and just collaborations with community partners? Well, so some of this is related to what I uh, just, just mentioned, I think. So uh, one challenge is a project that uh, starts and then stops. Because often what uh, I think genuine and the most valuable community engaged research entails is a much longer time frame for uh, interactions and evolution. And so even if you have uh, co-creation at the beginning of what you might think of as the research life cycle of a given project. What we know about research is you find things you're not necessarily expecting to find. It poses new questions. So do you sustain that? And are you thinking about the value of that research to the community partners uh, and to wider, wider groups who may be less invested or less connected to the, the research enterprise? How do you sustain that over time in a way that uh, works for the community organizations, works for the broader community, and also aligns with uh, expectations within the university. So one of our challenges, this is uh, maybe look, looking ahead to another question that you have, but, I, but I'll just mention it now, is uh, the, not just the resources we're providing to faculty along the lines of training and how to do this well, training for students who may be involved, uh, but also uh, what we value in how we decide to hire particular faculty or what postdocs we decide to bring into our community, and then what career progression is like for people. Is this, is this work something that uh, moves you forward as a scholar, as a researcher, as a, as a professor, uh, or is it something that is a nice thing to have, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually have the weight that uh, gets you tenure, say, or moves you uh, to a, 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 the next rung on the career ladder. That's, a, that's definitely something that, that, that we have to, to be thinking about uh, much more intentionally. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, with uh, starting with the issue of time, we definitely encounter that in our collaborations as well, and one of the ways that we decided to set up a structure that would allow us to um, come in and intervene in discrete ways is the Duke Environmental Justice Lab. Uh, I refer to it as almost community adjacency for students. They don't necessarily directly engage with their community partners, but the that types of students who join the Environmental Justice Lab are computer science, statistical analysis students who really enjoy sitting in front of a computer and doing analysis. And it's not that they don't want to meet their community partners, but that is, you know, they're, they're not the ones who want to go out on uh, Saturdays to the farmer's market and table. Um, they want to do some sort of quantitative analysis that serves the community and so they can do something discreet 
that a community might need, say they need some census data analysis, and, or you know, it might be a bigger question that we can do in a discrete way without needing that long-term um, investment, and then you can have the faculty and the staff who are having those deep collaborations that end up generating those discrete projects for the students to do. Um, some of the other conditions that I think about are just, we don't talk enough within our, ourselves and the staff and the faculty about developing skills of trust and recognizing that there's multiple types of trust. Uh, we tend to think first I, I, about competency trust, right? That's when I go with faculty and staff into communities for their first time, I notice that, that they want people to trust them because they're an expert in what they do, and that's competency trust. Well, you still probably, for a community, have to show them that you're competent. They don't know our standards of competency, but more importantly, it's uh, beneficence trust getting the, the uh, building the relationship for them to know that you have their best interests at heart, that you will uh, put their interests on par or above your own as a researcher. And also, you know, sometimes recognizing that uh, we need to recognize sometimes we are in a community on proxy trust. The community is allowing us in because there's another researcher who has a relationship and they have proven themselves to have that competency and that beneficence trust and to really respect that your colleague is, you know, you're, you're going to affect their relationship in the community if you're not very careful about how you engage. So I think we need to set conditions where we talk about that more um, and also talk a lot more about intellectual humility, not just what we have to offer communities, but what we have to learn from them as well. I mean, I think I have grown more from working with the communities than the communities necessarily always grow from working with me. I have been lucky enough to see conditions on the ground change materially in some of my collaborations, but for the most part, it has changed me and made me a better researcher and a better teacher. And I, I think approaching it with that notion of intellectual humility that this is going to develop us too is a, you know, a condition that we really need to cultivate here. One further thought here uh, on that point of intellectual humility. Uh, scholars in the academy uh, are familiar with the so what question, why does your research matter? And often the answer to that question is a reference to other scholarship, not always. In community engaged, <laughs> in community engaged research, that really is not, that's, that's not what, what matters. And so that salience question is, where is this going to have impact, the, the, impl the implications of the research? How is it going to feed into some decision-making process or some set of understandings that will tangibly change conditions in the world mm -hmm. for people, for communities, for, for the environment in some cases? And so this is, um, this is a, a reframing of the, uh, how one decides what questions to ask and how, with whom to have a conversation to, to make what is in some ways for a researcher the most important decision, what am I going to spend my time on, um, that looks very different from a community engaged context than from a more academic one. So we've already started to get into this a bit, but what do you see as some of the the main challenges to doing community engaged research well, and um, if there's also any practical examples for how you've overcome or tried to overcome them, um, that would be great to hear too. Sure, I think something that we haven't touched on yet that is a, a, a big challenge is the recognition that we are sometimes placing a burden on communities when we send our students out, um, maybe in a, a classroom where we have a community engaged component if it's not carefully constructed in how students might be reaching out to community, um, not recognizing necessarily that student groups are also wanting to do volunteer projects and get out into the community, that people are wanting to do their theses and research in community. And so sometimes communities are getting uh, inundated with requests, particularly sort of uh, very visible community organizations. And often they will, you know, when I'm talking with them, they'll say to me, I don't even have time to respond. Who is this? Um, you know, should I, they'll send me the request and say, can you translate this for me? Is this something that I should engage with? Um, what will come of this? 
Um, and so really recognizing and thinking about the, the supervisory burden we might be placing on communities if we're sending students out without a structure. And then that tension that Ed's talking about with if, if tenure requirements are that you have to do something completely different to get tenure, but you still want to do the community engaged work, but you don't have the time to invest in the um, su close supervision of students when you send them into community, that can create that um, problem and misaligned expectations because a lot of times the community groups are like, yes, I would love to have a, a Duke student who's hardworking and very intelligent come and do work and they don't necessarily recognize that, well, they are by definition students learning to do things and to get good work out of students, you sometimes have to put work in um, to supervising them and, and giving them instruction and maybe that's been natural for me because I started in academia as a clinical legal teaching instructor where we had to, to get our clients to sign retainer agreements where there is a lot of legalese where they actually say, I recognize this is a student who's going to be representing me in court. They have never done this before. This might go bad, but I still agree to it. Um, and then it's been you know, very strange to come into the world of community engaged research and social sciences where we don't have those conversations with our community partners and really um, give them some sort of uh, either structure and scaffolding to help with that supervision or at least some sort of um, warning that this is coming and, and asking, you know, is this something that you can really take on? Is this something you have the capacity to do or does it need to be in a more structured and scaffolded way? Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there. And so um, Kay has already referenced the it's one impact of the decentralized nature of a large research university like Duke, which is that you have a lot of faculty, a lot of students uh, who uh, in some cases may have intellectual curiosity and others deep commitment to a notion of uh, public engagement, but who aren't thinking about the broader impact of uh, many, many different researchers, many, many different students reaching out in a way to, to engage. Um, one of the responses to that from Duke's side in recent years has been to develop an office of Durham and Community Affairs. And that, has, that, that office is, is working very hard not only to build strong relationships with, with many different community organizations across Durham and, and uh, the Triangle, uh, but also to think about a whole set of issues that ideally would, uh, 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 that need a more coordinated approach. So for example, where are the areas where Duke should be in a more centralized fashion focusing attention? How does that relate to community priorities? This is something that DCA has been working on, uh, I think, uh, assiduously over the last several years. How then can we uh, structure incentives for our faculty to think about how they can link their expertise to those areas? and build the relationships that would be necessary to address community priorities. Um, how can we more uh, regularly and constructively engage with community representatives in how we then implement uh, efforts to address community priorities? So if we're going to have, uh, for example, an internal competition for funding that would go to research projects, how can we ensure that the, those proposals reflect the kind of longer term uh, partnerships that, that Kay has described? How can we tap community expertise for making decisions about which proposals to fund and, and which not to fund? Uh, these are all things that are underway. Uh, we need to get better at them. It's going to be a process. Just follow up too, because you also asked about um, different solutions and uh, just at a researcher level wanted to say one of the ways that I have done it is really um, that experience of having that retainer agreement uh, led into now having some sort of memorandum of understanding with my community partner about things like student supervision, how they prefer for it to go, how, and really setting those expectations up in some sort of memorandum of understanding when we begin. Um, and also looking for partners when I look to find a new partner, I use asset-based identification of looking for communities that they have some sort of internal capacity there already. Um, and you know, as for the leadership aspect, I'll look at the leadership of a particular community organization and see 
are they people who live in the community? Are that, or you know, if it's not geographic proximity, are there people who are in their leadership who represent that particular community? And is there some sort of underlying capacity already there that needs some sort of catalyst that is ready for engagement with um, expertise that wants to be on tap with them? And that they tend to have more readiness and it also leads to richer outcomes rather than that um, some tradition of some researchers of looking in the census data for the, the neighborhood that has the worst conditions, kind of defining them by their social problems and going there. Instead of doing that, look for a place that has some sort of asset and capacity that needs some support that we could give and may be experiencing social problems that we could help with in our work. There's something you mentioned earlier, too, about um, in, in partnerships with communities having a more structured and scaffolded approach. If you could explain a bit more what that looks like. I remember in particular you talking about masters and PhD students and yes, scaffolding yes, them. In, in the EJ lab. So one of the, the issues in working with community is also um, that there's so much student turnover about the time that you get them to know the communities particular issues they're moving on, uh, particularly if it's a credit-based um, one semester project. Um, so in the EJ lab, what we tend to do is recruit students from different levels of the university. So for undergraduates, we will hire you know, second semester freshmen who um, already know that they want to pursue a heavily computational sort of um, course of study here at Duke or, or you know, early, sophomores and have them on our uh, research assistant staff as students so that they can um, build institutional knowledge from the seniors that we have who have been with us since early on so that we team them up and by the time the senior graduates that sophomore has come into a skill set and knows the community's issue to carry the uh, project on and you know the the same thing happens with our PhD students, trying to make sure that we have students at different levels and making sure that our teams are structured in that way, that there's always someone who has the institutional knowledge about the community project, teaching it to someone who is coming um, into the uh, environmental justice lab. Thank you. I think one of our, one of our challenges are, are, is going to be uh, doing a better job of setting up mentoring frameworks for our faculty, so we also have faculty who are better at this and have more experience with it and others who are um, wanting to move in this direction and so can we create a community of practice mm -hmm. in, in, for that same kind of tra transmission of, of, of understanding about how to do this with humility and with a real ethos of partnership. I think that gets to the last question I had and then we'll have um, an, an opportunity for the audience if any of you have questions you can raise. But are there any last thoughts on how you think Duke University as an institution needs to evolve to better support community engaged research for faculty, for students, and for community partners? There are, there are a lot of things we can do. Uh, there's the question of robust uh, resources for training, something I mentioned before. Um, we have responsible conduct of research requirements. We don't have as much uh, uh, grounding as we should around the, the, uh, the challenges of community-engaged research. Uh, that's something that the people are looking at. Uh, Kay mentioned the value of MOUs. Well, it would be great if people didn't have to just start from scratch every time, but had templates, uh, which could be then adapted to particular circumstances. Uh, but it also, this, I think there, there are questions about how we think of, uh, uh, with regard to strategy around faculty hiring and certainly uh, standards for evaluating faculty performance. The more that we are hiring faculty, looking for people who've already been uh, trained in and have experience with community-engaged research, the more they, when they arrive at Duke, will be able to hit the ground running with it. Uh, the more that our tenure standards our standards for promotion for faculty not on the tenure track uh, indicate the, the value of this and have clarity about what uh, excellent community-engaged research looks like. Uh, the, the more people are going to ha be able to do this without seeing it as something that reflects their internal drive, 
but that they have to do in addition to a whole set of other kinds of, um, of, of activities in order to move forward in their careers. And just to, to get on a more granular, granular level of things that um, I encounter as challenges that would love to, to see the university have a better way of addressing institutional review board practices when you're doing community engaged research and you want it to be a co-researcher with your community partner, you know, it's, um, it's a challenge sometimes. And I understand the institutional review board exists to make sure that we are protecting our human subjects and um, it, is also there to protect the institution and and it is often a challenge to get them to understand what it is we're doing and why we're doing it and our systems just aren't set up well um, to have community co-researchers and there are universities who are innovating about the, the ways that they do institutional review boards and even you know we've talked about how communities have been incorporated and played the have community members placed on institutional review boards or have a separate community institutional review board. Some communities themselves, particularly indigenous uh, communities, are setting up their own institutional review boards that if we want to go into their communities, we have to go through. So I think those are some things that we also have to deal with. Grants and um, contracts and how we, you know, if we're going to be doing uh, fundraising and have grants with our community partners, how do we treat them? in those contracts, and I don't think that that is something that our, um, our administrative and research support staff are as familiar with as the sort of more traditional model of research. So there's also a lot that we could do there to really make it easier on people who want to do community-engaged research. So, so what are the parameters around providing compensation to community partners? We're, it's, it's, still, it's still pretty murky, unfortunately. Um, and, an element of this that I would certainly like to see us move toward is having expertise around community engaged research in our research administration. So the people who are on, uh, you know, part of the institutional review board process, the individuals who are part of grants management, does that team include people who have some background in this area? That would be very helpful. Agreed. So we have a bit of time to take some questions from the audience. Um, Julie, yeah, can use my microphone. Any questions? I see one in the back here. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jill Ferguson, I'm coming from NC State. And I heard you touch on the importance of prioritizing the community's research needs. Uh, as well as how can we compensate them. Uh, I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, the challenge of providing short-term benefits. Often our research goals are uh, long-term and maybe even a little hard for the community to, to grasp or to receive the benefits of that research. Um, so do you have any ideas about how we can provide better value upfront or in a short-term capacity? Uh, a, lot, a lot of times it depends on, the, on this, the, the, not just the context of the issue, but um, the degree to which the question involves uh, applied research as opposed to something that is uh, less obviously related to a, a short-term problem. Uh, if, if people have concerns about water quality, uh, the nature of the search may have very short-term implications or benefits. Uh, but there's also the, the challenge that just because you've clarified what a situation entails, it doesn't mean that people who have the authority to do something about it will instantaneously respond. Uh, so there's, I think, an, an importance of uh, building with the community partners a sense not only of the stakes associated with the research, but then attention to the entire life cycle of that effort. There's getting the right questions, there's thinking about the methods, there's carrying those out, whether those are participatory or not. Uh, then there's the analysis. Okay, then what, what, is, what do you do with that outcome? Who is an, who's the audience for it? Um, if, if it's just academic publications, obviously you're not paying attention very much to the question of, um, of shorter term impact on community conditions. So, 
to what extent are the relationships that you're building also with local governments or uh, in some cases local firms uh, or NGOs who, for whom understanding the implications of the research may flow through to action in one way or another. I, I will say that um, one has to also have a different kind of humility in this because there, there is a, an appropriate function for community engaged research but researchers are not themselves charged with the capacity to make decisions for communities. Then the question becomes, okay, well, what are, what are the connections, relationships, transmission of ideas and insights from this community-engaged process to those who have authority to do something about it? Yeah, if I could just add, your question is an interesting one in that the communities I work with tend to not necessarily want to have a conversation about the short-term benefits. They want us to slow down. Like, hey, could you recognize that we need to build some trust and community and relationship here, and it might not fall within your three-year grant timeline? So could you slow down, and could we just maybe have you show up for the community potluck once a month for a year and show us that you're going to actually invest and give up your Saturday to come and be with us when we have the time to do this work. Um, so uh, sometimes the short term benefit is is that sort of trust building and just showing that you're going to be there. Okay. Great. Sure, hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Singler. I work with the Duke Clinical Research Institute and I am in charge of, um, or I lead rather, our research together practice, which is our people-centered research engagement arm. Um, and so my challenge is actually the opposite of Jill's in that many of our research projects are actually fairly short term. And so we have to engage the community quickly gain results, and then we try to come back when the results are ready to, to report back and, and share what we learned. Um, but most recently, um, you guys spoke about time and about trust, and building trust takes time. <laughs> but we're in this precarious situation where we might have these six months or six week to six month projects, and there's not that time for trust building. Um, most recently, we've done a lot of work in the COVID-19 research area. And one of our projects was with Eastern North Carolina um, churches and primarily black churches. And we came in and we handed out test kits for a short period of time. And the community really rallied around that effort. And when we left, they said, hey, we want more test kits. We've always needed test kits. Why are you taking something away? Um, and so that whole idea of an off ramp as a way to build trust over time, even after your research project has ended. I, I would like to understand strategies from you all for that. Um, so that, that's the challenge that we constantly grapple with. Uh, hi, Bill Pan, thank you very much for coming. So, what you guys were just saying about getting the feedback from the community to make sure it's more than just an academic, not just an academic research, that hit a nerve to me because Duke Legal doesn't agree with you. And there are so many times when I have, I have to create an MOU with a community where they want to look at the data before I have even a, uh, a flyer that says something about their data. And Duke Legal says, well, you don't need approval of the community. You can just publish. And the community should sign that document to say anything they give us is free to publish without their approval. And I've had to uh, convince communities to sign the document for us to work together and me promising never to do anything against their will uh, so that they can trust me not to you know, violate any agreements that we have. But there's a, there's a disconnect between what you're saying and what Duke actually does in practice, and I'm wondering if you can talk about that. So, Beatrice Pisic from uh, Pediatrics at Duke. 
And um, so I will piggyback right to the question of um, trust. And um, knowing that the, the main factor for the success of community-based research is trust, I was wondering how project with students are changing constantly and how the community react to, the, to this kind of um, study when it's not like NGOs where there probably there is a longer um, continuity with the same per uh, personal. So how is how the community is reacting to this kind of projects? Or is it just the inst institutional uh, impact that is important, just the fact that it's the name Duke that is, is enough for the community to to, uh, to participate? I can start. I think the answer to <clears throat> probably in, in some ways all three of these is I try to practice radical and complete transparency with my community partners of telling them about, yeah, I agree, there are disconnects between what we would like to do and what we can do, and that's part of what I was referring to with IRB and our research support staff and you know, uh, data sovereignty and uh, data justice, how we set those kinds of agreements up. Um, I would love to have a, a longer conversation. And I think there are people around the university who have had these uh, conversations with Office of Counsel, Office of Research Support, IRB, that it would be great if we sort of could all come together. And I think that this new center might help with that some and facilitate the conversations. Um, I am on the short term thing, I'd be radically transparent at the very beginning. We'd be coming in with test kits for a very short amount of time. We cannot be there long term. Is that acceptable? And, um, and that, just setting up that off ramp. And a lot of times when I am completely transparent with a community about a, a colleague at the Nicholas Institute may come and say, I'd really like to have someone serve on an advisory council for this grant that I'm writing, but the grant has already been written and the research already outlined, and so I'm radically transparent when I go to the community partner that they've asked me to go to, and I say, you know, the, 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 here's the research uh, plan, here's the question, and um, sometimes they still wanna join, and sometimes they say, no, that's not okay. So um, you will find a, a variety of responses in different communities if you're just completely transparent. And also, I'm completely transparent with my communities about what I can and can't reliably offer them given the institutional constraints I work under. And sometimes, if we're collecting data, that means that they choose to have one of the other university research partners who can do something differently through their structures be the place where our data is held, and then I license it back to do any research um, uh, with it from um, the community or that other university partner. Um, let me start with the last question, and then I'll circle back to the, the second one. Uh, what your, your question gets at, I think, is the absolute centrality of faculty leadership around projects, so that uh, the sort of attention to mentoring and to transitions and handoffs, if there are going to be different students involved over time, uh, is, is attended to with the right kind of, uh, of attention and, and care. Uh, that is something that faculty don't necessarily have when they get into this work for initially. And so again, the idea of a community of practice, I think, is, is something that's really important. We have a lot of examples across Duke of faculty who are doing this, I think, well, uh, and who are recognizing the power of that near-peer mentoring as well in creating a, a, a collaborative context where the exchanges and interactions um, with community partners is really positive. But it, again, takes a lot of intentionality um, and a lot of uh, uh, focus on building the right kinds of bridges and partnerships. Um, so one of the things that we have before us, Bill, I would say is uh, a focused effort not just to identify uh, the issues that are these challenges that make community-engaged research even harder than it should be because of our institutional structures, and uh, not just to identify them, but to, to ask some really hard questions about which ones are, are most important to address first and also which ones are most feasible to address first, which are not necessarily gonna line up perfectly. 
uh, and then to build the right kinds of, uh, of teams within our research administration structure to start making progress on these things. I hope that's going to be coming pretty soon as a, as a more focused effort. Uh, I've seen a lot of work around uh, data management at Duke in the last year that's had this structure to it. Uh, we've been working very hard on project management as, a, as a, an issue, and community engaged research is, is now, I think, something that we have to really tackle in a, in a systematic and strategic way. So I hope, I hope we'll be see action on that soon.